Well, thank you for coming. Um, yes, I, I was the wrong stuff uh, with regard to uh, uh, applying for NASA. My eyes weren't quite uh, good enough for uh, uh, military aviation, and in the days that I was applying to NASA or looking at applying to NASA, I had to go through military aviation channels. Well, that didn't work, and I went into a completely different approach, which was to look at the human past rather than the human future. And I went into archaeology. What am I, on earth am I doing talking about <laughs> spacesuits and space colonization from the perspective of human prehistory and archaeology, which is my profession? It comes from spending your time looking at the remains of ancient civilizations. And what we see is that the, the reason that I have a job is that civilizations fail. We have about a 99% failure rate for civilizations. Shang, Inca, Aztec, Maya, they all fell apart. They're all dust. One way to prevent this for our own civilization and the whole question of whether we should preserve our civilization or whether it's worth preserving, I think, is a completely separate topic. But uh, one way to preserve it, um, and the, everyone that we have uh, uh, admired uh, in this field in the past uh, couple of generations has told us the same thing. One way to preserve civilization is to make our uh, species multiplanetary. Today, it's Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, in uh, earlier generations, it was, for example, uh, Carl Sagan. So I think that the uh, settlement of space is an inevitability, or at least the attempt to settle space is an inevitability. And you can see this uh, first slide. You see that in uh, uh, 1567, Francis Godwin wrote this book about travel to the moon. And he, you can see there, it's very interesting, he's using uh, what his own map of reality is, which is to use the, the method to move quickly in his time was to hitch, hitch yourself to some kind of animal. <laughs> so he's, been he's being levitated, he's being drawn to the moon by the only method he can imagine, which is being pulled by some creature. In the preface to this book, he mentions that it is only a, a, a fiction, fictional fancy that we might go to the moon today in 1567. But he also notes in that preface that uh, it was not long before his time. It was also a fancy that the Earth was spherical. He's saying there that it was inevitable, or that it is inevitable to a degree, that humanity will go to space or try to colonize space. Well, in a lot of endeavors outdoors and a lot of uh, uh, trying to, I couldn't go to the, uh, the space program myself, so I thought, okay, I'll, f I'll find these planets myself, or I'll get into situations that are as far from uh, normal conditions on Earth as I can. So I spent a lot of time in the Arctic, I spent a lot of time sailing, diving, uh, gliding, and uh, I was learning there in many years of this that it's better to say that we will attempt to colonize space than that we will colonize space, because we don't get it for free. <laughs> you have to work hard. And you have to tread a very fine line between caution and boldness. Our maps, we've been hearing a lot today uh, about maps and realities and the disjunction that you can get and how dangerous it can get to be separated, right? to, to, to believe more in the map than in the territory. And we know that we need to constantly refine our territory, uh, redefine our, our maps, so that they better match the territory. This is a picture of southwestern Iceland, and you can see uh, in uh, 1550, Ortelius made this beautiful map showing the sea creatures, the kraken and all of these other sea creatures in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, North Atlantic there. Well, we know that those were not real. We know that they were pointing to a variety of reality, but it took oceanography and science to really point out what those are. And of course, the closer and closer you zoom in to the coastlines and so on, the further you see the divergence uh, from reality uh, uh, and the map. In the same way, premise three is uh, that uh, our map of humans in space, and this is a phrase I'm starting to develop, Humans in space, generally speaking, is inf insufficient for space settlement. We've been in a mode of exploration. We've been in a mode of individual people, extraordinarily uh, a tightly constrained set of individual people popping up into space and then popping back down. Now, we do have uh, 25 years, almost a quarter century, of continuous human presence in Earth orbit. Uh, in the past 25 years, there have only been a few days in which there has been nobody orbiting the Earth. So we're starting to get a larger uh, population. We're starting to move towards thinking about populations of people, but it's still in the very tiny numbers. If we want to do space colonization, we're going to have to look at communities. And communities 
uh, are composed of not just uh, one or two test pilots, Air Force trained. <laughs> uh, these are children, there are adults, there are elderly people, there are infants. Uh, most of them are not going to be test pilots. We only need a few people to fly the things. If we're going to do space settlement and space colonization, you need people of all varieties of talents. You're going to have universities. You're going, I mean, you're replicating human uh, uh, civilization, Western civilization uh, of some variety. You're replicating that, and we're going to need all of this. And that requires a major shift in our thinking, away from individuals and towards communities, away from individuals and towards cultural groups. And this requires an anthropology of space colonization and space exploration. One way to do that, let me go back one, one way to move towards that is to uh, look at these larger numbers. For example, I'm looking at the population genetics of large colonies. You can look at what Elon Musk wants to do, put a million people on Mars in, in the end of, a, uh, end of a century, something like this. If you want to do that, you're going to have to understand the entire genetic uh, uh, system of humanity even better than we do today. Not only that, but all of our dom domesticates as well. We have to know the developmental genetics of, uh, uh, from fertilization right through the entire life of the individual, uh, for example, with, um, uh, again, with humans and our domesticates. And to do that, we have to reinvent, essentially, an anthropology of humanity beyond Earth. Another thing that we're going to do, though, let me skip forward a bit. Another thing that we're going to do, though, is rethink and reimagine and rebuild, and this is really the focus of my talk, the, the essential technologies. We have to make it a lot cheaper and a lot easier to access space. And one way to do that is rebuilding the technologies. On the left, you see a NASA suit from the shuttle era. This is an ACES suit, and it costs between $88,000 and about $100,000. This is what's called a launch entry suit. It's meant to get you up to orbit and back down in case the uh, cabin has a breach of pressure. It then inflates, and it gives you about 3.5 PSI, a third of a bar. Pressure inside the suit, you're breathing 100% oxygen, oxygen, you'll be okay until you get back down. This is not a suit for floating around outside. That's the $12 million suit. The $100,000 suit can be replaced by the $2,000 suit. My project and my group, Pacific Space Flight, are starting to work. This is an entirely private group. It's not a company. I don't want to be in business. On the right, you see uh, the suit that we've built over the past few years uh, inside um, uh, my home, which is my workshop. We've heard a lot about how or, or the things that we need to do, the things that we need to change to make our or to better our, uh, our, our maps as a... Um, reflection of reality. Here are some nuts and bolts approaches. Here is how this was accomplished. I began, of course, with historical research. I looked into uh, uh, what is the history of pressure garments. And believe it or not, I live in Portland, Oregon, beautiful place. On the far left, you see there the first US patent for a pressure garment, first US patent for a pressure suit from Fred Sample of Independence, Oregon, a tiny little town in, in, in Oregon. He envisioned this as a suit for high altitude climbing. They were beginning, this is 1919, they were beginning to recognize the cor correlation between uh, increasing altitude and decreasing atmospheric pressure. And he knew that you needed a bubble of pressure around you to, to, to prevent decompression sickness. So he proposed this suit. Didn't really catch on, but hey, this is, uh, <laughs> this is a beginning. Uh, in the middle and on the right, you see pressure suits from the 1930s. And they're starting to sort out some uh, essential issues, and you'll see it a little bit later. But they're starting to sort out some essential issues in holding together pressure, prevention of decompression sickness, giving you enough mobility, delivering the proper breathing gases, exhausting the, the exhaled gases. A lot of what I was trying to do was build it by hand, or build these things by hand. And I knew that, uh, or a long time back, I'd, I'd, I'd learned how to so seam sails by hand. And I knew that I could stitch things together. And I knew that these suits were just stitched together. They were pigskin, and they were canvas. They were then sealed with rubber. And they were holding pressure in the 1930s. And so I thought, OK, I'll start experiments. I'll start seaming these together. I start with a lot of drawings. I plan everything with care. And then it gets more and more complicated as you start building. This is an elbow section. It's called the convolute elbow. It gives you mobility even at high suit pressures, which is what you need. Without that convolute elbow, you're like this, at high suit pressure. And the detail uh, 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 increases and increases. So on the left, you see I've got the drawing, the sketch that I've started with. In the middle, you see I've assembled. There are about 55 items 
cables and so on, just in the one elbow joint. And in the right, you see further on, I've taken a, a bar or a, a rod of, of uh, brass, and I've carefully wrapped it around the arm, wrapped it around the hand, the palm of the hand, to prevent the glove from bloating out. If you look at the way that NASA suits are done, it is precisely the same thing. It's just me sitting in my workshop watching TV doing it. All of the performance criteria for a launch entry suit for uh, NASA are being met by the suits that we're building. On the right side, you can see the liquid coolant garment. This is actually, we want to get rid of this and use uh, uh, gas ventilation, but we're keeping ourselves cool. We're maintaining proper pressure. We're giving ourselves mobility at high pressure. We had the suit up to lunar pressures, lunar suit pressures, 3.7 PSI the other day. Didn't blow up. It works. There's a detail of one of the gloves. We've had very good collaborations. We've worked with Copenhagen Suborbitals. Recently, they were awarded um, uh, the Breitling Mile Milestone Award for a, um, uh, uh, an active guidance system on their uh, pretty unique rockets. And Copenhagen Suborbitals, based in Copenhagen, they want to put a human being into space by DIY methods. And you can see there we are with uh, uh, the capsule and uh, uh, Christian von Bengston and uh, Peter Madsen. And uh, that system or that, that project has changed recently, but we were with them for, the, for a year or so. They no longer need us. Uh, they, they've changed the design of their capsule, and uh, perhaps we'll connect with them again. But it was a great connection for a while, learning to coordinate the suit design with a capsule and a seat. I mention I or me sometimes. Keep in mind there's an entire group, which I call uh, Pacific Space Flight. This is the Pacific Space Flight group. And we've been starting now to fly uh, and to do flight testing. So we're going in helicopters. Uh, we're going to build a balloon. We're going to go to high altitudes in, in a balloon. And this is exactly what NASA did. The day before Alan Shepard went up as the first American, there were two Navy pilots who went up in a high altitude balloon testing exactly his suit. So we're replicating very slowly. We're going very slowly, not recklessly. Very slowly, we're replicating the systems of uh, NASA. Go forward a little bit here. Ergonomics, we're looking at this, the, the shape of the suit is always carefully tailored to the uh, capsule. And no suit is, is, is designed separate from the capsule itself. So we're starting to work on that. We've gone underwater. I've spent about 100 hours in the suit. And um, uh, part of it has been underwater, uh, lashed to a table, because, or to a chair with the uh, weights on because of the buoyancy. Uh, and they lashed me down, and I sit there, and we look for leaks. It's the only way to find the smallest leaks coming out. And we've knocked out those leaks, and the suit is, uh, has a much lower leak rate than uh, Gemini suits from the 1960s. You can see NASA archival footage of Buzz Aldrin swimming around in one of these suits, uh, in one of these test pools, and there, there are bubbles just streaming from all kinds of places in his suit. We've beaten that. <clears throat> We've been in altitude chambers, and it has maintained, the suit has maintained my blood, blood oxygenation level at a healthy level. So all the tests that are proper to do, we're working our way through them, and we're going to high altitudes now. We're starting to me measure uh, biomedical information as well. Here are these two... Uh, high-altitude balloonists. Unfortunately, one of them, Victor Prather, uh, died uh, on the pickup. Uh, they landed in water. Uh, one was picked up. Uh, the other one, unfortunately, he fell in the water, and his, his suit flooded. Um, and they didn't have provision for flotation in water. Uh, anyway, that was, that was one day before uh, uh, Shepard. And look at the, uh, the high-tech uh, that's being used here. You see the, the, the uh, uh, levers or louvers that are used to control light, sunlight coming in. They're afraid of being blinded. It's very bright up there. So they used uh, just window louvers that you would slide down and you turn the knob and they close. And that would be to knock out the light or you could open it and you could see. And that reminds me that when we're building these things and testing all of this, I'm doing everything exactly the right way. When I look at this, I look at these very carefully and I see the same thing as I see in my workshop. I see a plot of glue laying there. I see hose clamps of the same kind we're using. They've got a crescent wrench sitting there. They look the same. I've visited with engineers, spacesuit engineers, in the private space industry, and their, their systems or their workshops look like our workshops. The problems they're having, we're having. The pr things they find easy to solve, we find easy to solve. So I'm very happy to say that uh, we're uh, doing well with this. Uh, we have three and a half minutes to go. Um, 
here's a quick, I think maybe in about a minute or so, we'll uh, have a look at the suit. And I think they're just coming to it, uh, uh, coming to it right now. Um, I've been in the cold chamber for uh, about five minutes before our entire system was, was shut down by the cold. Well, we put some glucose into the coolant system, and the coolant kept flowing. Uh, and you can uh, uh, continue on like this, more underwater, underwater testing, skydiving stability testing, flotation testing. Uh, it's a replica of, of NASA, except in the 1960s, except we don't have the big budget. OK, Louis Philippe, you want to come out? Anybody there? Let me call him. This is Jean-Louis. <laughs> this is Louis Philippe Lanc. OK, calm check, calm check. Louis Philippe, how are you doing? Calm check, calm check. OK, transmit. Try again. Nothing? OK. We won't try to communicate with them. We've got a problem with the radio. Well, what you see is the essential garment. You're missing the flight coverall here. Uh, right now, rather than an automatic uh, feed of gas, he's giving himself uh, bursts of breathing gas here. He would pass out in about two minutes. You have about two minutes of breathable gas in the suit, uh, so he's maintaining that. He uses a pretty low suit pressure right now. Um, uh, a, a, a high suit pressure, again, will turn you into this unless, as we've done, you've very carefully stitched this restraint garment, this mesh, to a shape that when it's inflated doesn't give you this posture, but rather gives you this posture, which is what you want. And that's how it's been stitched. He's not running a coolant system inside there, so that's uh, something we haven't built yet for, for <laughs> uh, we haven't built a cooling system for portability yet, but we do have it in our trainer, in our, in our trainer where we sit back like this and we do flight simulations. We're eventually going to these high altitude ballooning uh, expeditions where we're going to uh, sit in a seat but underneath this high altitude balloon and all the way up we go. If you turn around, Lee Philippe, if you turn around, he's walked across the Simpson Desert in Australia, he crossed Tasmania, and he's done talks here at TEDx, and here today he's in this thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, unusual life. So here he has a corset. This is an easy and simple way to uh, adjust it, for, uh, to customize the shape or the size. These are those convolute elbows. These took a couple months to figure out. Uh, most of the things that I've done and most of the money that I've spent, which is very little, uh, has been waste. That is, this, this is finding out how not to do it. Now we know how not to do it. I have 22 seconds. The next generation garment is going to be a third of this weight and a third of the bulk. This functions. You could go in a Soyuz capsule tomorrow to the ISS in this, in this suit. It might be risky, but you could do it. The next suit, much better. Five seconds to go. Want to try another com check, Louis Philippe? Now, let's open him up. Do you want to say anything? Actually, you have into this mic. I have to speak in your mic here. OK. <laughs> That's it. That's an El Moya. <coughs> I guess you go that way, or I go that way. <coughs> <laughs> you go that way, I'll go this way.